What's the power of a college degree? We've put so much value on it over the past half a century. College grads use it to express their credibility. Employers see it as a rite of passage that signals skill and accomplishment. Yet today, recent graduates in America face record high unemployment. They carry a trillion dollars in debt. That degree no longer guarantees middle class success. And employers question whether they're getting the quality they need. Suddenly, there are new ways to learn, from free online courses to immersive classroom technology to startups that teach you just the skills you need. How do we need to learn in this new age? What are we willing to pay for? And what are the essential skills of a 21st century workforce, especially here in the Pacific Northwest? We'll explore these questions and more with four creative leaders who are hacking EDU. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks, live from Husky Fest at the University of Washington. Leonardo da Vinci was an engineer, a scientist, and a painter. His timeless creations prove that experimentation and exploration are common to both art and science. That's why even as we push for left brain STEM graduates, we shouldn't forget that crucial creative half. As author Daniel Pink declared, the MFA is the new MBA. Mark Gonzalez doesn't have a Master of Fine Art. Still, his renowned poetry and a Master's in Education have inspired his drive for imagination and invention in the classroom. Mark, you were a visiting scholar at Stanford, the heart of Silicon Valley, very tech-oriented. If you were to teach a class in engineering with your thoughts about creativity and innovation, how would you go about that? I think at the core of any question around the arts, you have to begin with what is the function and the purpose of arts. And at the core of it, we have to remind ourselves that art and artists are the educators of imagination. Often when we per conceptualize of anything in the aesthetic field, we think of it only in a consumption manner. There's a stage, we watch it. There's a movie, we watch it. There's a song, we listen to it. It's only one directional. And in, we don't necessarily think about the process of creativity itself, that engineers need to be creative to actually address the issues that we're facing as a humanity and as a species in these days and times. So architects have to be creative both with their resources, educators have to be creative with their budgets as well as their curriculum. What we're really dealing with in this time is how do we be more innovative? And you cannot address innovation unless you're actually addressing imagination. So how would you bring imagination? There seems to be such a stigma right now against the liberal arts, about, against studying poetry that we have to focus on science technology and engineering how do you say you know what you got to learn this stuff too so I think the way most people would try to frame it would be to bring the question into how the arts can benefit science and I think it needs to go in reverse and ask how can science benefit the arts and how are the arts necessary for the future of humanity if we look at it inside the United States and we think specifically we speak predominantly a variety of many languages, most people speak a Latin-based language, whether it's English or Spanish. If you look at poetry, the core root of the word poetry means to make things, you know, at least in Latin. If you look at the core root of poetry in Arabic, it literally means to speak emotions. So when we get into the artistic field, we're actually talking about emotional intelligence. And what is the role of emotional intelligence in education? In the United States, 36,000 people a year commit suicide. Over one million attempt. If we even look at just the successful suicides, the enrollment at the University of Washington for undergraduates is 27,000. If you took the suicide successes in the United States and put it inside the University of Washington campus, you'd be at a deficit of 9,000 students per year that you're putting into the grave at an early age. And so we have to ask ourselves, when that type of emotional reality is what we as a humanity are facing, 
and these days and times? How do we begin to unpack and explore that? And how can we unpack and explore that if we're not in conversation and dialogue with our internal emotions as well as our interpersonal emotions? So we've asked you to think about this converse, this topic and this conversation, and if you were to create something, some kind of poetry, we asked you to do a little performance for us to sort of get our emotions and imagination going. Do you have something that you could share with us right now? I would love to. Okay, Mark, there's your mark. Um. In any conversation, we always begin with respect to First Nations and to the indigenous, in Seattle, the Duwamish, and with love, dear Columbus, you cannot discover a land 70 million people are living on. Never understood the term Indian giver. Our original people only gave life to pilgrims two centuries before the Bill of Rights, only asking for our right to breath. Instead, they read us our right to death rights and white rights to land, which landed us right in the middle of reservations and they wonder why our hope is reserved. It's a force of habit when those with habits hosted masses are labeled us half savage, half heathen, to the point where centuries later we are still believing that we are not beautiful, but no more. Therefore, let it be known that I am a Mesoamerican Mexican. Born in 1975 to be part of the hip-hop generation, predestined to be malnourished in the 80s when President Reagan thought ketchup was a vegetable. Just so he wouldn't have to buy my brother's school lunch program, Green Beans, we learned to survive off the music, stood in line for CDs like it was government cheese, and instead of black beans and collard greens, we ate MCs for lunch. As such, our resistance to death had us labeled revolutionary like public enemy number one, one of those children of the sun. Our Native American drum is the root of this history called hip hop root is in pre before our rhyme mind is in line with the divine design. We survived a vanilla ice age. Got crucified in death row records only to be reborn in a Jurassic five age. Those who have you believe that we, like Chuck D, are what's wrong with the world today. Those who will not sit down, shut up and conform, but we were not born to conform. We were born to grow, create, rebel, grow, create, rebel. We were born in hell and died twice for surviving. The hood is proof of the afterlife, life after death, life called breath. We are beyond Christ. We don't break bread. We break dance and break beats to feed the masses. Masses meaning people like the Black Panthers for the people, like the word Mexica of the people, like most deaf. My people, I am Mark Gonzalez representing our people, our people. Our people without hesitance. The question is, at the end of your life, who will you represent? And let me be clear, till the eyes of I and I cry from Mau Mau to Mumbai, I grind for the ghetto in Gaza. Dear world, the sexiest party of the human body is its spine. I really would like to see it more often. Mark, thank you. So are we at heart a creative culture here in the United States? I think we have to really address again, in this time, we need more questions, less answers, um, and finding that we need to be engaged in a collective process. So when you ask me, are we a creative culture? I actually wonder what our culture is, because politics has a culture. There's a culture of violence, there's a culture of silence. We also have a culture of love and compassion. And all these are both intersecting as well as in conflict with one another. And so we do have a creative culture. We also have a lot of cultures that are ending up with too many people in coffins at a too early age. The question is which culture is going to win out? And how do we, and this economy, and when we talk about economies, I keep on hearing people talking about we have to get jobs, we have to talk about the future of funds. When we don't even know what the economy of dollars and capital is going to look like in one year, how do we begin to address economies of emotions? All right, well, I think we'll leave it there. We'll come back to that when we have our questions from the audience. We'll be right back with all four of our creative leaders with questions from our attendees.